Good afternoon. My name is Job Snyders from NTT Communications, a IP transit provider. And today I would like to share with you an update on routing security in the second quarter of 2019. With you, I will share some new developments in terms of software and tools that I've observed or participated in, uh, and I'll share with you what I consider are the largest challenges we face at this point in time. Uh, I appreciate you listening to me in English. I guess for most of us, English is our, not our native language, so we'll try to make the best of it. If you have questions at any point, uh, feel free to walk to the microphone or at the end of the presentation. I want to cover what currently may hold up some RPKI deployments, what some of the impact on business operations is in that regard, or lack of impact, uh, efforts that exist in industry to address these challenges, uh, and then we'll cover some uh, news on networks that deployed RPKI in recent months. By far, at this point in time, the largest challenge is that a few hundred people have misconfigured their RPKI ROAS, and this introduces what are called in BGP RPKI invalid announcements, which in context of business are false positives. And the number of invalid BGP announcements as a result of RPKI uh, uh, misconfigured ROAS leads some people to believe that they cannot uh, enable RPKI-based origin validation on their routers uh, because they fear they will uh, lose some of their revenue or cause problems. But we should realize in this context, imagine somebody has a slash 16. They have split up their slash 16 into two slash 17s uh, because they may have two data centers or two pops. And it could be that at some point in time, a few years ago, a former employee configured an RPKI ROA in the LACNIC portal and specified that the only correct BGP announcement is a slash 16 with a maximum prefix length of a slash 16. What happens on BGP routers that apply origin validation is that both the slash 17s would be considered uh, RPKI invalid, but in reality these are false positives because it was not their intention to mark these slash 17s as invalid, but because there was no feedback loop for a number of years, because there was a lack of RPKI deployment in the wild, uh, it never impacted their business. Or phrased differently, we may not get the computer to do what we want, but the computer in many cases will do exactly what we told it to do. And we have to consider as an industry, as a community, what the ramifications are from not deploying origin validation or deploying origin validation. Because it is impossible for my routers to distinguish between a misconfigured ROA and a malicious attack. And if I choose to not deploy RPKI, I will still be able to reach the misconfigured uh, uh, networks, but I will also accept BGP hijacks and accidental misconfigurations, typos that somebody made. Or so we have to make a trade-off. Should we be liberal in what we accept, conservative in what we send, or do we say, we should be strict in what we accept, because we will honor people's ROAS to the letter, because we believe that has the most positive impact on business. And even in IETF context, there's a lot of debates around this topic, like how accepting should we be? Uh, if you click this link and read it later, it provides a very interesting insight. And some suggest that John Postel, in some regards, or in context of our current time frame, uh, may have been wrong. I think the path towards deploying of RPKI is to just deploy it and don't wait any longer. And I'll share with you some data why I think uh, we can now take a more strict stand than we could perhaps have taken uh, one or two years ago. 
And what I mean with BGP-based origin validation and its deployment is that on each and every eBGP session, any routes that come in and are marked as RPKI invalid, that those routes are rejected. There is no point in adding a community, there is no point in lowering the local preference because more specific routes always win. The only viable thing we can do with RPKI invalid announcements is reject them because we cannot differentiate from malicious activities or misconfigurations. If we look at how some of this is, uh, uh, what is happening at this moment in the industry, we've seen that the leap a few large networks have made has positively impacted the amount of false positives in the routing system. Because AT&T chose to deploy with quite strict policies, many networks had an incentive to complete, correct, their configured ROAs. Suddenly, there was a ramification to their misconfiguration, and there no longer was a status quo where uh, whether you created a ROA, a good ROA or a bad ROA uh, was irrelevant. And we've seen that with each and every deployment of invalid is reject policies, the number of misconfigured ROAs drastically drops. Because it turns out that many people uh, will, will recognize, oh, there is a routing issue, maybe, and these are not outages. It may just be that routing now will take a, a longer path or a more expensive path. Uh, it is quite gentle, the concept of networks enabling origin validation one by one. And this actually motivates people to take a good look at their ROAs. Because many organizations are overloaded. The, the, the amount of work uh, we have to do is can be overwhelming. So when I email networks saying, hey, I think you uh, may have misconfigured your ROA, it is entirely possible that those networks will put it somewhere lower in the uh, priorities list because there's other more pressing things to do. But the moment there becomes a, there, there's an outage or an economic or, or a latency incentive to correct that ROA, suddenly you see people uh, prioritizing that and taking action. If I can make an analogy to uh, deploying filters on a route server I volunteer for in Canada. Uh, at some point, after we emailed all the participants of the Internet Exchange that we would deploy secure route servers and would apply IRR-based filters, we noticed that we could not motivate them to, to fix their objects. And at that point, we just flipped the switch and suddenly another group of people uh, realized that they actually had to do So some people react good to kind emails, some people react better to a sense of urgency. And I think we are now at the point in time of RPKI deployment where it is valid to use a sense of urgency. There are some study resources related to these uh, false positives. Uh, Nusunu has compiled an excellent uh, tool, the RPKI Observatory, uh, where this person carefully analyzes which networks are, would be impacted, which won't, and he categorizes by country, by, by ASM, uh, and it would be worthwhile to check out these links and see if your organization is impacted or not. If you're not on any of these websites, you're good. If you are, please, go to Milaknik and correct your RPKI ROAS. And the fact that we have been deploying origin validation on internet exchanges, in CDNs, in large transit networks, uh, has shown positive effects because in the last six months, um, the amount of false positives was reduced by nearly 50%. And this to me shows that there's a very strong correlation between deploying these technologies and false positives slowly disappearing. Now let's look at some tools, because even when I tell you uh, it is uh, good to deploy invalid is reject policies, it would be nice if you can validate this for yourselves. 
and preferably validate this in a way that does not impact your business operations. Um, to this end, uh, Paolo Lucenti and myself worked to extend the open source traffic analyzer PMACCT. This is a free tool any of you can download. What PMACCT does is it will take IP fix, NetFlow, and SFlow information from your border routers. It can also ingest uh, via an IBGP session from every edge router a full view on uh, the BGP tables relevant to your organization, and it will then correlate these information sources. And this tool allows you to precisely analyze how much traffic from which customer is flowing to, to which customer or peer, or in the case uh, where you're a, a hosting provider, you can see exactly where your traffic is flowing to, what the prefixes are, what the ASNs are behind your transit providers or peers that are relevant. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic tool that gives you great, great insight in your network. And what we've done is we've implemented the RFC 6811 origin validation procedure inside the traffic analyzer. And this means that in the aggregation step where PMACCT helps reduce the, the gigantic uh, amount of information that is coming in through SFlow and, and NetFlow uh, and reduce it into uh, information that is relevant to generate business reports, we can now also identify, are we sending traffic to prefixes that are marked with RPKI invalid state? And how much traffic is that? Is all of that traffic behind one neighbor or is it across the board? And more importantly, PMACCT can distinguish between two types of false positives. If you analyze the RPKI invalid announcements that exist in the default free zone, we can differentiate between two types. Type one is unrecoverable. It means there is an announcement and there is no alternative path. If we reject that announcement, we will not have a path towards that prefix. Type two can be implicitly repaired. This means that for although there is traffic flowing towards an RPKI invalid BGP announcement, there also is a less specific announcement that is either unknown or valid. And this means that if we reject the RPKI invalid announcement, we will still have a path towards the IP addresses uh, uh, we want to reach. And from my perspective, the, uh, uh, what we've come to learn through this PMACCT software, because in NTT's network we, we deployed it, there is virtually no traffic towards unrecoverable uh, RPKI invalids. And this means that maybe that IP space is used for, is not in use. There is traffic towards the implicitly repaired uh, uh, announcements. Uh, but we will continue to have a path towards those announcements. So those, that type of RPKI invalid announcement is less relevant to our operation. What I've done here is I've uh, plotted out the aggregate traffic of our backbone. I am not at liberty to disclose how much traffic flows through entities backbone, uh, but what I'm willing to share with you is uh, the legenda of this graph. The blue space is traffic towards IP addresses that are not covered by RPKI ROAS. The orange-yellowy color indicates traffic flowing towards RPKI uh, valid announcements. So this is traffic that goes to prefixes where the owner of the prefix created an RPKI ROA and the prefix announcement matches the ROA and therefore it is valid. So we can already see that between 50 and 20%-ish uh, of traffic is flowing towards RPKI uh, valid destinations. And this means that it is worthwhile to deploy origin validation because it will secure a large portion of our traffic. And as time will uh, go by, I expect the yellow band to, to grow in size. Then what is much harder to see, uh, there's a pink layer 
Those are the uh, recoverable announcements for which a unknown, which means uh, the yellow band or uh, the blue band or a valid, the yellow band uh, exists. And then at the top of the graph, there is green and that is unreachable. And as an artifact of the way I generated the graph, I couldn't get it smaller than a single pixel. But the takeaway from this, and this has been confirmed by many other networks as well, is that there is virtually no traffic towards the RPKI invalids for which no alternative route exists. And this means I can now go to my management and legitimately say there will not be revenue impact, there will not be business impact if we deploy RPKI origin validation with invalid is reject policies. And the likes of AT&T have confirmed these numbers. They have not noticed a statistically significant difference uh, before they deployed and after they deployed. But this is open source software so you can run the numbers yourself. Um, then furthermore, I am very happy to, to report that the RPKI cache validator situation has drastically improved over uh, the last uh, few years. We now have more choice than ever when it comes to choosing RPKI, origin, uh, RPKI cache validators. And this is important because in a healthy ecosystem, you want at least four or five implementations in order for there to have to exist two excellent implementations. It's the same situation with DNS from way back when. We only had bind. Only having bind as a DNS software uh, introduced fragility in this uh, community because if everybody relies on the same software, a bug in that software will affect everybody immediately everywhere. And therefore, a degree of diversity is very, very important. So it is great to see that there is Routinator written in Rust and that Cloudflare released uh, their own RPKI software written in a different language with different features and characteristics. Um, this will help all of us. I want to zoom in on a pet project of mine, RPKI Client. Within the OpenBSD community, there is a desire that OpenBSD should be the first uh, network operating system that if you install it, out of the box, you can have secure routing. Because out of the box, OpenBSD already includes a BGP daemon, an OSPF daemon, and if we tag on a RPKI client, uh, those BGP updates can be validated and we can develop routing policy to reject invalid announcements. Um, as a very nice side effect of this, we also created a new implementation of the rsync uh, protocol uh, with a different license, a BSD license, uh, and I think that's very exciting as well because that may open up additional cool use cases. Let's zoom in a little bit on another effort that is going on, the use of RPKI to clean up the IR. The IR is this decades-old collective federation of databases. Well, it's not really a federation, but a collection of databases. And over the years, a lot of still or, or garbage data has been uh, introduced. And not all of this was, was intentional. Uh, companies go out of business. Uh, it may be that then there's nobody left to clean up the route objects in one of the IR databases. Let's assume uh, the best of intentions. But if this data continues to exist, it continues to have to carry a risk for our normal operations. Because if your prefixes inadvertently get included in somebody else's filter and that someone else uh, uh, leaks a set of routes, it could still negatively impact your business, even though you're based in an entirely different region. So one of the efforts on the way to clean up the IR is to clean up the RIPE non-authoritative database. Months ago, the RIPE IR database split into two segments, the RIPE IR, which is validated and authenticated and where only route objects exist that were created with the explicit permission of the owner of the resource. In other words, 
there are no LACNIC prefixes in the RIPE IR database, and this is a good thing. And there is the RIPE non-authoritative database. And the RIPE non-authoritative database is an artifact of, of how we've run the internet for a long time. And it does include LACNIC prefixes, uh, and they probably should not be there. So we have a proposal underway to help address this issue and remove uh, or clean up uh, uh, these entries leveraging RPKI data. Because we can say that if a RPKI ROA exists, it's a higher source of truth than the IR route object. The combination of prefix and origin that are described in the IR route object, if they are in conflict with the RPKI ROA, it means that if you perform origin validation, that combination cannot exist in the default free zone, and therefore we can conclude it should not exist in the IR either. Another effort uh, in this context is the development of a new version of the IRD software. Uh, IRD version 3 was a organically grown code base uh, written in C uh, to which many people have contributed. And it has reliability issues and there are issues with extending the software and introducing new features such as leveraging RPKI data in context of the IR. And this software is so critical to NTT's operations that we decided to fund a project and completely write it from scratch in a modern uh, language. So to compare, old IRD was 60,000 lines uh, and the new IRD is only 10,000 lines of Python. Some of the advantages here are uh, it's extensible, it's well documented, there's regression testing, uh, unit testing. Um, I would like to, if you rely on IRD version two or version three, please take a look at IRD four uh, as a replacement for that because a lot of exciting things are gonna happen. Then, uh, I would like to draw your attention to uh, a book some friends of mine wrote recently and released to the public. Uh, it's a book written from the perspective of a network engineer that wishes to improve uh, their routing operations and what are the next steps? What, where do I start? And it's quite affordable, uh, so I would recommend you take a look at this. Another resource I would like to draw attention to is RPKI at read the docs. Uh, it's also linked from the website rpki.nl. Uh, this is a resource maintained by the fine folks from NLNet Labs, and it contains a wealth of information, a FAQ that is really targeted uh, towards newcomers to this RPKI thing. Uh, and I myself also often use it as a reference. So this is good quality documentation I could recommend all of you to use. YYCIX and Cloudflare were one of the first to deploy origin validation and start cranking down and rejecting invalids. And this has set the tone for others to follow as well. Because now we have larger and larger companies that are deploying origin validation. And if these large companies and large internet exchanges can do origin validation on their route servers, on their border routers, I take that as positive encouragement that you and I too can deploy origin validation and that it's not outside our reach, that it won't damage our business because clearly these organizations believe it is positively impacting their business, not uh, detrimental. Uh, so for instance, IXBR uh, announced today before yesterday that quite soon they too will drop invalids and this will have great impact on all of us. So, you are not alone, is my message here. Um, with that, I hope we have time for one or two questions. If you don't feel comfortable asking a question at the microphone, always feel free to send me an email at job at ntt.net. Uh, also, if you're a competitor, that doesn't matter to me. Uh, what is good for the internet is good for NTT, is our philosophy. So, questions, comments, concerns? Now is the time. Gracias, Job. Thank you, Job. Uh, un poquito antes de la pregunta.
Quería agregar que sobre los, el primer tema que estuvo mencionando Job, hay una sesión a las cuatro y media de la tarde en el Salón Bávaro 1 sobre firma de ROAS, que tiene relación con esto de las RPKI Invalids, así que están invitados quienes eh, quieran revisar cómo están creados sus ROAS. Eh, bueno. I see uh, a question. Hola. Uh, you always mentioned about uh, a, a way to. Uh, we have two, two kinds of problems: uh, origin validation and path validation. You always mention about the peering to a solution to uh, avoid the, to deal uh, with the path validation. Uh, I believe that in transit, this is not very well accepted. Let, let's say, uh, on the past, we had uh, RPSL that nobody did on that. Uh, do you consider, uh, 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 Geoff Houston mentions about uh, the possible or considerable pass uh, as a solution to path validation, an alternative to path validation. Uh, what is your opinion about that? Path validation is formal path validation end-to-end -end, uh, across more than a single peering link is, is an incredible challenge. There is not a practical solution today that covers each and every corner case. And as an engineer, I am at this point baby steps first. If we do origin validation, we already uh, prevent tons of misconfigurations, a lot of the attacks, uh, and it, we must start with being able to validate just the right most ASM. Then, as an alternative to, to, to path validation, I believe it may be possible to use a out-of-band mechanism, uh, BGPSEC is an in-band mechanism, where we can communicate to each other who are valid neighbors for my ASM. And I refer to this uh, in other presentations as peer lock. And peer lock prevents NTT from accepting BGP announcements uh, for certain ASNs uh, behind all eBGP sessions. And if you combine that with origin validation, you can no longer spoof the origin to sneak a uh, prefix into our network. Granted, this only resolves a number of the use cases, but I'm, I'm really focusing on low-hanging fruit first. And as Peerlock currently is a, a manual human-to-human -human process, I believe that in IETF we may be able to, to optimize it and standardize it in a way that the technology becomes available for everyone and that the execution in our networks can be done with existing tools such as AS path filters. Um, whatever we end up doing to do path validation, whether that's peer lock or BGPSEC or a different solution, we must first do origin validation. That is the order of things. Uh, and saying that one problem is not addressed will, should never preclude us from solving a number of other problems. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I would like to, to compliment. Uh, uh, do you believe that RPS uh, do you do you believe that RPSL can be uh, bring bath on the dot to help to calculate the graphos from the uh, interconnections? I do not believe RPSL can be brought back. What I do believe is that we can look at the nice features in RPSL and mimic those in an RPKI style validatable uh, data object structure. RPSL was always unencrypted. Uh, there were a lot of questions which object is the correct one, which one is uh, owned by the resource owner. Uh, so leveraging the RPKI publication mechanism is the correct path forward. And it could be as, it could be that we take a subset of RPSL and re-implement that in RPKI. That is, that is a possibility. But the original RPSL spec has some fragile, uh, fragile elements that are unresolvable. So we must innovate here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, 
I think that's it for me for today. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good day. Thank you. Bueno, con eso termina esta sesión del foro técnico. Eh, les recomiendo.